for this uh, very kind introduction. Uh, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. So let's see if it works here. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Yeah. So um, I'd like to walk you through a little bit of what we do in Sweden, the Swedish recipe of improving diabetes care through benchmarking. And we do use a lot of technology, which is, of course, an advantage with uh, a healthcare system that can afford it. Uh, but I think uh, many of these things can be applied even with a lower rate of technology. So this shows data from the National Register. Uh, and what we can see here is series both from the adult and the pediatric uh, register and from patients who have started as children and then gone on as adults. And the green bars show a fairly good control of an HbA1c around 7.5, both in the pediatric and adult register. And here you can see in blue those with a very high HbA1c, both in pediatrics and as adults. And this, this shows here the percentage with retinopathy. And as we would expect, if you have a high HbA1c, well, you will get it. Um, and if it's high, both in pediatrics and adults, that's not a surprise. But the red ones with the same degree of retinopathy, 80%, are actually those that had high HbA1c in pediatrics, but then went low as adults. So it doesn't really save you if you start getting a better control only when you become an adult. Uh, and also we can see over here, the green bar, that's those with a control of around 7.5%, both as pediatrics and adults. And that doesn't really save you from retinopathy because 25% of it, of them still have retinopathy. So let's go back for a while on, uh, back to 1922 when insulin therapy was started. And then in 1935, the NPH was introduced. So up until then, you had to take four injections per day. Uh, there was a publication in 1960, not many people read it, but what he did was to compare uh, the therapy and of course, if you had this type of syringe, you would be happy to take only one injection per day. So he compared uh, 15 years of diabetes, and uh, this shows the therapy before 1935 with four injections per day here, one, two, three, four. You get a good insulin profile, and you get a blood glucose profile mostly below 10. So after 15 years of this therapy, 9% had retinopathy, but after 15 years of NPH, once or twice daily, with some uh, regular insulin on top of it, 61% had retinopathy. So it really shows that you need a physiologic insulin profile. And this lady, she lived to be 93 years. And she started with DKA at age 7 in 1924. So she had this therapy for uh, at least uh, 10 years to begin with. And that's what we call the metabolic memory to get a good start. Now we have compared HbA1c in eight high income countries, Sweden, Germany, Austria, Denmark, Norway, USA, England, and Wales. And you can see that the mean HbA1c, and this is back in 2013 to 14, varies between something like 7.5% and up until almost 9%, even though they all have money to spend on the healthcare system. We looked in the same cohort, we looked at HbA1c in different age groups, and you can see that the, the curves here are parallel. So it means that the increase in age and in puberty is the same in all countries. But for example, a teenager in Sweden has a lower HbA1c than a preschool child in the USA or England. So there is a large difference between countries. And, but it, this is the biological increase, which seems to be the same in all countries. Now, here we have the Swedish HbA1c over the years from 2013, where that comparison was taken that I showed you earlier up until now. And what has happened? Well, here we have the quality improvement collaborative. So we'll come back to those. But that helped us bring down HbA1c. And then it came down a little bit every year. 
And here we changed the target to 6.5% or 48 millimolars per mole. And that gave us a further decrease of HbA1c. And here it has kind of stopped, but this is the pandemic year of 2020. So what about severe hypoglycemia defined as unconsciousness or seizures? Well, you can see that when the HbA1c goes down quicker, then it's a little bit higher, higher above 3%. Then it goes down again. And same thing here, it would increase a little bit above 3%, but then it goes down again. So there is not really an increase in severe hypoglycemia or ketoacidosis in spite of this uh, rapid decrease in HbA1c. So what did we say? Well, uh, this is the thermometer that was used for patient education. Uh, but we didn't start the low HbA1c target. That was done in the UK by the NICE guidelines in 2015. And they said like this, explain to children and young people with type 1 diabetes and their family members that an HbA1c target of 6.5% or lower is ideal to minimize the risk of complications. And then it's not really a target, it's a, a medical fact. that That's how you can get the lowest risk of complications. And then, of course, all families will go along with it. And ESPED lowered it to 7% in 2018, and I think that's fair if you don't have the modern technology uh, available for cost reasons. And Sweden came after in 2017. So what about the variations between clinics? And this is taken from open internet. So any patient can go and look at this, where you have all the clinics named, and the mean <coughs> HbA1c for the clinics varies between 6.5 and 7.5%. So there's only a 1% difference between the clinics in Sweden. But if we look at the percentage below 7.4 or 7.5 is the ISPAT target, it actually varies a lot more between over 90% and down to around 50%. So here, uh, there is a lot to do still. So how do we look upon this register? Well, you can look upon it as just a bunch of kids trying to do their best, uh, or you can look at it uh, like a serious competition where you really have to win. But we prefer to look at this uh, this uh, open benchmarking as a cycle race, uh, where it's a friendly race and we share taking the lead. So these clinics up here, after some years, they will be down here and somebody else is going to have the lowest HbA1c. And since 2006, all the clinics have been openly named. And of course, there was some fuss in the beginning, but that died, died down very quickly because now you know who's doing well and you can share your best ideas and practices and tricks and you know whom to ask for advice. Or you could do like the Vidori study did uh, many years ago. They had the two clinics with the lowest HbA1c give lectures as is bad to share their data and way of doing it. So what has then helped us in Sweden? Well, we've had the Quality Improvement Collaborative Project. And uh, here you can see the HbA1c, and this is from 2000, from the Millennium Shift. And here it starts going down quite rapidly. So this is where we started the collaboratives. And around here, 70% of the clinics had, had gone through the collaboratives, but then you can see the others go down as well. And so that's called a spatial spillover effect that we saw in non-participating centers. Uh, because we talked at this in a, at every conference and every place we met, we, we shared ideas and that way, and all clinics came on board. We had, as I showed you, no increase in severe hypoglycemia. So what is that a quality improvement collaborative? Well, it's a fancy name. It just means that you meet regularly. We met four times over 18 months. And in between, we did our homework. Uh, for example, ACT, PLAN, uh, DO, STUDY. It's a way of uh, sharing uh, data within the clinic and uh, brainstorming, come up with good ideas how to improve things. We benchmarked in the National Register, and uh, this went on over 18 months. Uh, the most important thing here, is, I think, is that we could see the results in real time, so to say, with the benchmarking with the register. 
And we had coaches. And one thing that was very important, I think, was that often younger team members were chosen as coaches. And they met much more often to uh, share ideas and the progress of these uh, collaboratives. So what did we do at our clinic? Well, we had a, a very simple idea. Keep HbA1c below uh, 6.9 or 52 millimolars for the first 18 months. So how did we do? Well, this is the control group in blue, and the green is the project group. And you can see that we did rather well here. And it even continued up to 24 months, where there is a, a huge difference in the percentage below 52. So what did we do? Well, it wasn't really rocket science. Already in the control group, we had uh, multiple daily injections from the onset. We gave injection port to preschoolers, and they also got an insulin pump. Everybody had a blood ketone meter available and CGM access when needed. So the project group, I think very important, was carb counting. We did that from day one now. And they, everybody below the age of 10 then got an uh, injection aid. But the most effective trick was very simple. Download your glucose meter and check the mean glucose over 7, 14, and 30 days. Do this every week. And if it's above 8 for two weeks in a row, call us, But then, because then we need to do something about it. We also had a diabetes coach, which meant that their parents were helping other parents at the onset. We encouraged fathers to take part in the diabetes care. And downloading, we did that at home and encouraged people. Uh, we did that at clinics, of course, and then encouraged families to do it at home as well. But also very important is that we all had the same target, the same ideas, and we all put trust into the project. And this is a download uh, from a, a blood glucose meter, and you can see a lot of data, but that's even if you have only a few tests per day, you can actually get quite a good idea here. See, it's high in the morning. It's much better during the day. And it's high in the evening again. Here's a program called Diasand, which is available all over the world. This is the web address. So you can start an account there, which is free uh, of cost for patients. And now this is modern technology with CGM. And here is a pump with two doses. And then it's easy to see that the doses are taken here, but the child actually started eating here. So the uh, dose is too effective when it's taken late, ends up with hyperglycemia and another late dose. But this helps in the daily uh, practice of helping, of telling families where they can improve their practice. Now, with this project, we started to look what had happened really, and we found that Already at three months, our control uh, group that is in orange and the blue is in uh, the project group, the blue was much lower already at three months and continued to be lower. These are two published uh, publications where you can see that it is higher already at three months. So now we have looked at national data uh, in Sweden and we can see that over the years, actually, the nadir here at around four months has become lower, and that has uh, yielded a lower result that is uh, visible over two years here. And also, uh, we've seen that it continues even longer. Uh, we did another project where we looked at different countries. <coughs> Austria, Germany, for example, uh, and this is a lifespan project, so age on the x-axis and HbA1c on the y-axis. And it goes up during puberty, as I showed you earlier, and then a down. 2011 compared to 2017. And you can see that the, the curves here are almost identical. And there was an overall difference of only 0.1% between 2011 and 2015 in the combined Austria-Germany register. What about USA? Well, here you can see it's actually higher. I think most of you have seen that publication. Uh, but here we can show that it was higher in 2017, almost until 40 years of age, and then there was no difference. So that means a deterioration of metabolic control in pediatric diabetes patients over the years. What about Sweden? Well, it's the opposite. I showed you pediatric data. 
But between 2011 and 2017, we can actually see that the, this decrease has taken place over the entire lifespan, which means actually that this is in comparison between the countries, the adult uh, data are now very much identical, but the pediatric data in Sweden are lower. So what are then the country differences? Well, we collect national data in Sweden and in Germany in pediatrics. Uh, Sweden is the only country that has an online register with open comparison between the clinics. Quality improvement collaboratives have been uh, done in most of the centers in Sweden, in some centers in the US and also in some centers in Austria, Germany. Targets, well, Sweden 6.9 and Austria 7.0. At that time, Germany had 7.5 and prior to 2014, the US even had 8.5 in the youngest children. National health insurance is available in Austria, Germany and Sweden, not in the US. Sweden is the only country where all pediatric patients are seen by pediatricians. Pumps are reimbursed in the European countries, not in the US, and free insulin and diabetes care are also available in Austria, Germany and Sweden. While in the US, the estimated out-of-pocket cost for diabetes is actually around $800 per month. Now, if you look at uh, GDP uh, and the amount of money that the government actually spends on healthcare, you can see why there is a difference. In Sweden, uh, more than 80% of the health cost is paid by the government. Uh, and in Germany, slightly below 80%. But in the US, not more than 50% of the health cost is paid by the government. And I took India here as an example. These are world bank data, where it's somewhere between 20 and 30% of the health care on a national level that is paid by the um, government. The rest is paid by patients. So, um, oh, sorry, this should be pediatric, not only preschool children, and the elements of success. And I've tried to, to work into this, what can be done in India as well. So, Begin with carb counting from the onset. I think that is most important. And you can actually start with MDI in every patient. We have to remember that uh, the DCCT was done with uh, regular and NPH only. No analogs. So that even if you cannot afford analogs, you can do uh, carb counting and MDI. Of course, pump after a few weeks when they have learned injections, that's impossible in India, and also CGM access. But you have some private patients who can afford this. And I think that's a very good starting point because then the doctors can learn how to use the systems. And once the economy improves, uh, things might change quite a lot. And with CGM, it has actually been shown that putting your money into CGM is more effective than putting your money into pumps when it comes to lowering HbA1c. And it just might be that we have the same situation as with telephones, because in many, many countries nowadays, uh, when they expand, they all have mobile phones. Nobody has landlines anymore. And that means that if we could just figure out a way to make CGM a bit cheaper and more accessible, people could go directly to that and skip the uh, glucose meters except for some situations where CGM doesn't work. Uh, ketone strips for the urine are good. The blood is, of course, better, but uh, they are much more expensive. 24-hour hotline doesn't really cost that much. And most important, tell your families to aim for a low HbA1c. Don't say it's impossible, because it's not. We need the families in the driving seat already after two weeks of diabetes. And then the really simple trick, check mean glucose over 7, 14, and 30 days on your meter at home. Download, uh, well, if you don't have a pump, you can download the meter, and there are a lot of free programs available for that. And we need both parents, of course, to be engaged in the diabetes care. And the most important thing is to improve. Uh, this is a very busy slide, but look at this arrow here that shows the decrease in HbA1c in UK, England, and Wales. And these are the different measures they have done 
And over here, we have the quality improvement collaboratives. So they actually go down with about 1.5 millimoles or 0.15% per year. And it doesn't really matter where they start. You can see here they had, for many, many years, high, very stable HbA1c. But then they said, okay, we have to do something about it. And as long as you are slowly progressing downhill here, you will eventually reach a much lower HbA1c. And if you compare to Sweden, this was Sweden 2003, 2008, 2011. And so they are actually improving much more quickly than we did. So is it impossible 6.5? Well, I wouldn't say so. It's difficult, but it's not impossible. It's like climbing Mount Fuji in Japan. You need a common philosophy in your diabetes team. You need good preparations beforehand, but then you can bring everyone to the top and have them uh, achieve as good HbA1c as possible, which is, I think, 7% is a realistic target. And for example, in India. And with that, I'd like to thank my colleagues in the Swedish Diabetes Registry and the City Council of Jönköping, who started the Quality Improvement Collaboratives. So thank you for your attention.